Hello and welcome to the Yorkshire Voice. I'm Seb Sternick. And hello from me, I'm Lauren Entwistle. On today's programme we'll be talking about everything from homelessness to veterans football. Welcome to the show. Since being named the City of Culture for 2017, Hull has seen a number of transformations from the regeneration of derelict areas where there has been massive change. The locals have had their say on what could potentially be a new beginning that will bring plenty of opportunities for the East Yorkshire City to improve. Ben Gazdek has been down to take a look. It's showtime for Hull as this year's City of Culture comes to Humberside. During its opening month, the fireworks and light displays have attracted hundreds of thousands of people in the opening month. During my stay, I speak to local hero David Burns and have a chat of what he thinks the event will bring to Hull. Uh, I think it brings confidence. I think it brings hope. Uh, I think it brings investment. I think it brings jobs. And I think it brings the best party we'll ever have in our lives for a year. I think it, it brings great benefits and it brings people from all over the country and all over the world to see what we've got here and it's terrific. I've lived in a lot of cities across the country and across the world and I felt the city of Hull was hiding its light under a bushel so I've always been supportive of the idea of getting city of culture and say come on we need to shout about it we've got beautiful public spaces we've got beautiful buildings the people are fantastic and there's loads of stuff going on in the city. So for this year's city of culture £32 million is funded throughout the year. £20 million of it is invested in events and activities. We have £5 million in community engagement, with the following £1.6 million left over future events. This has been described as Dorf and original £20 million budget was raised by Derry in 2013. This has been financially supported by 61 organisations and companies, including a £3.6 million grant from Water City Council. So what do the people of Hull have to say about this? I'm impressed actually, yeah. yeah. Better than I thought it was going to be and uh, I really enjoy the, the evolving stuff that's coming out all the time. You're going from every day there's something new being released. Uh, I think it is very interesting and special because I, I've i been there for three, uh, six months and uh, uh, as a student to study in uh, Hall University, so uh, I think it's very amazing and a surprise to me. I uh, love the fireworks, millions of them. Our kids are like the biggest one yet, I think. I also spoke to the CEO of the City Culture team, Martin Green, who seems pleased with the work so far. It's been amazing, really. You, you kind of make work that you hope people will like. But then, you know, there's, there's liking it and there's loving it. And what we found was that for, for one reason or another, the work that the artists made during Maidenhall really connected with the people of this city and the visitors to this city. And we saw, you know, 340,000 people come through over seven days. It was, it was the most amazing week and a great way to start the year. Obviously, we've installed the Blade now in Queen Victoria Square. The Ferrens Gallery reopened on Friday. 10,000 people went through that this weekend. They're, they've got more exhibits to come before the end of the month. At the beginning of February, we're going to open our new contemporary art gallery, 64 Humber Street. That will push us forward through February, where we've got our Back to Hours festival in communities across the city and towards Easter. So much more to come. So with many more events coming across the Humberside area, you can imagine the sheer level of excitement the locals could be proud of. Ben Gustick, Yorkshire Voice, Hull. And joining us now is Yorkshire Voice reporter Ben Gustick. How are you, Ben? Hi, Ben. I'm good. How are you two? I had a question, Ben. First of all, what on earth is that massive white thing <laughs> in the centre of Hull? That's what we've been thinking the entire time we've <laughs> been watching that package. Well, come to think of it, it's a handmade blade that was 
donated by um, Siemens, which is a, a local um, wind turbine company. Ah. I'm actually a bit disappointed. I thought, it would be, I thought it would be modern art or something. Uh, you know, I'm no expert in modern art, but I, I quite like it. It's so good. Tell you what, we are digressing though. So, Ben, what can we expect from Hull being City of Culture? Well, thanks to the City of Culture and press team, I've been sent the official press release. What's going to happen for the next two or three seasons? And what we can expect is 40 new commissions of world premieres, 24 festivals and 30 new expeditions. This will be followed by the Maiden Hall Festival, which will run throughout the year. And we also have our local popular festivals, the Freedom Festival and the Humber Street Sesh Festival. And to um, obviously top it all off, we've got the Radio 1 Festival. Obviously a lot of money has been spent on this uh, project. Do you think it's money well spent for the taxpayers of Hull? Yeah, well, it's about 10% of the annual £32 million budget that was raised by um, 61 organisations and companies. Um, but um, the, the providing 10% of the whole budget and you know it's up to the people of Hull if they want to take these opportunities that have been given to them. That's fair enough. You and you mentioned the, the, the BBC Radio uh, Festival in Leeds. Gosh, yeah, that, well, in Hull. In Hull, in Hull, apologies, in Hull. <laughs> we think that's wishful thinking there. You know, what can we expect from uh, from that? Who Who's going to be playing? Well, it's been um, announced that Stormzy, Skepta and Kinza Lane will be headlining. Mm. Obviously, we have the rest of the lineup on the website. God, very it's nice. Fantastic lineup for Hull, isn't it? Tell you what, I could expect, I might go. I will see you there. Oh, thanks very much, Ben. Thank you very much, Ben. But until then, uh, the cost of housing has long been a problem for people who just want to get their foot onto the property ladder. But one group in Leeds has started a project that will not only provide housing, but also make sure that it is affordable. Lauren, hit the streets to find out more. The biggest, most expensive and most important thing anyone will usually buy in their lifetime is a home. And with the current housing crisis, it's becoming more and more difficult for prospective first-time buyers to get their foot in the door. Yes, I think um, it's very difficult these days for young people to try and get on the housing ladder because the houses are so much more expensive. Uh, I think it's now eight times the, the average income uh, and that just becomes impossible for a lot of people. I wouldn't have been able to buy a house if I wasn't in with my boyfriend, so I'm buying a house by yourself still seems really unreachable. I kind of I lived in Hare Hills towards the end because it was the most affordable but not a very nice area and that seems to be what you have to do to live in Leeds at the minute but it's not a great quality of life you're kind of working to pay your rent and then that's it and then trying to meet your rent is a nightmare and it's just not not fun and so being a place that is great like Leeds and not be able to do anything is kind of it's not it's not fun. According to Halifax, the new average age of a first-time buyer in the UK is 30, with the average house costing four times the homeowner's annual income in 2014. But one community land trust is hoping to put a stop to that in Leeds. There was a, a group of us um, working on empty homes, affordable housing, various community-led housing projects in the city. And we thought, is there, a, is there anything we could do together and do more than we could on our own? So we got together, set up Leeds Community Homes and then basically thought about set, setting up a first project in this opportunity to create 16 flats in, in the centre of Leeds. Came up and we needed to raise around £360,000 for that. So we kind of focused with the community share offer to do that. You'll be aware probably being in Leeds of the huge increase in rents over the past couple of years and they're just it's unaffordable to so many people um, and also we know I think we know enough to know that people are struggling to get on their housing ladder so they're struggling to save up a deposit whilst also paying these extortionate rents so community-led housing is not all necessarily about affordable housing but if we are putting the people first then affordability is going to be one of the key criteria I think for most people with building about to go ahead the project should be a step in the right direction in providing affordable homes. So more people can leave the nest and get the keys to their own place. Now, from people who can't afford to buy a house to people who simply have no home at all. 
Over the past few years, there has been a steady incline of homelessness in the Yorkshire area. As of last August, 30,000 people were recorded as being homeless or at risk in the area. That's a rise of just over a third since the year 2010. With the number of rough sleepers on the up, there have been calls demanding that more should be done. Seb has been down to take a look. Homelessness is a growing issue, not only here in Yorkshire, but all over the country. And with thousands of people sleeping on the streets every single night, two questions arise. One, why is this happening? And two, what can we do to stop it? After speaking to people in Yorkshire, it is clear that the reason behind homelessness is a combination of unemployment, a lack of government action, and a failure in the social care system. I thought it's lack like of social, social services type care. Yeah. You know, they're just left to fend and there's no yeah. sort of backups for them, and then they just sort of slip between gaps. Mm -hmm. Because uh, no one has secured a job yet, and they um, no money too, and the economy is uh, damping. Yeah. Quite poor, and the government is uh, responsible. Yeah, the lack of work. I, I, I lost my job, I was made redundant, so a certain other ethnic minority could take my job three months later for £2.15 an hour less. It's, it's horrible to see people, and, and they get pigeonholed, they get labelled, you're disgusting. Why, well, because I ain't got nowhere to live. That could happen to you in three months if you lose your job. That could happen to anybody. There are many initiatives across the county which try to tackle this growing problem. Speaking at Leeds Trinity's ending homelessness event, Mark McGreevy, who has worked in the field for over 20 years, proposed a number of possible solutions. Well, I think there's, there's three things that we need to do. The most obvious one is that we, we need to build more social housing. We need to provide more social housing for people so they can get into that housing at a low rent. We have a chronic problem of mental health on our streets at the moment. We need to have more services that are fit. To, to and flexible to deal with those mental health needs. And the third one is we look at, need to look at those really entrenched people who have drink and drug problems on the street and provide the services that allows them to go through to detox. With over 150 people coming to the event, Donald Forrester, who works for a local charity, was encouraged to see local people speak passionately about the idea of ending street homelessness. Well, I, don't, I, I don't think it's difficult to, to see that problem. You, you, you walk the streets of Leeds and you see it. You, we, we know people, we see them every day, don't we? And it's, it's about doing something, isn't it? And, and sometimes that homeless person says, don't look down at me, do something, you know, and sometimes that's talk to me, you know. I think that's where the passion of the people in this room came, wasn't it? You know, there's so lots of anger about big society, government and legislation issues, but what comes over is we care. The event also gave people a good idea of what action is needed in order to fight the problem. John McLaughlin believes that the cooperation between organisations and charities is crucial. There's lots going on in Leeds, I'm sure, about street homelessness. I think what's probably necessary is to get people who are already working to coordinate and to try and get good publicity to, to build up what he was saying, make it become something that everybody's interested in and wants to solve. With over 4,000 people still sleeping on the streets every single night nationwide, is there still hope? Oh yeah, of course, of course. Just look at the number of people that have turned up, the number of people that really care about this. Nope, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. I'm always hopeful. Uh, there's a difference between a wish and a hope. A, a wish is something you make and you, 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 you suspect it won't be achieved. A hope is something that you, that you have that, that you think will be achieved, so I'm always hopeful. Moving on, you can never be too old to play football and that's what's happening down at Ilkley with the veterans team. Men who are 40 and over are still playing the game with the same intensity as the youngsters. Jack Simpson went down to have a kickabout. Ilkley veterans playing in a league game at Ilkley Town Stadium. The veterans team attracts players for the over 40s and the club has teams for all age groups. I joined Ilkley five or six years ago, so it's good for Ilkley, so Ilkley got teams at every age group from reception right, which I, I coach actually my, my son plays reception and I play for the veterans so uh, we've got teams at every single level cradle, cradle to grave cradle to grave yeah the veterans team originally formed in 1992 despite a break the side have now enjoyed a assurance with the team reforming a decade ago we pleased to have a veterans team uh, we've had it for five or six years uh, it's players who've played a lot of football for either for Ilkley or the, the next village along, which is Burley. Um, so to get them playing into the 40s, they bring the kids along. Uh, it's a great, it's a great thing to have. Yeah, absolutely. 
Elkley Town operates a one club philosophy with teams for all age groups, right from the under fives to the veterans in their forties. When the players have come right the way through the club, they've played and they've given us everything that they can in terms of a first team perspective. I mean, we've, we've even got lads in the first team playing now that are 34, 35. Um, they've then got somewhere to go after um, and still enjoy their football, which is really, really important. The veterans team are looking strong for the future, with the younger players setting their sights once their career in the first team comes to an end. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I love the game a lot, you know. I'm thinking about whether I'm playing in the future. Obviously, I think whether I'll be playing when I'm 40. And, you know, if it, it's something that's ideal for for my um, my age at the time. So, you know, if there's if there's a load of other guys that, that's in, you know, you're in the same page. And, yeah, absolutely, I think I'd love to play. With the team currently sitting top of the league and young players setting their sights on joining, the future for the veterans team looks bright. So Seb, do you think you'll be playing contact sport when you're in your 40s? Uh, that's still a quite a long way, way away, so uh, I hope so. What about yourself? I know you like a good marathon. I do like a good marathon, however it's strictly of the film variety. Those kind of marathons? Yes, very uh, much so. Uh, Grassroot referees. Uh, coming, came together on the 1st of March to stand up against the abuse they receive. The No Ref No Game campaign was set up by Ryan Ham Hampson from Manchester as a plea for the FA for more protection. There is a huge lack of support for amateur referees in England and hundreds of officials are hoping for change. Tom Wilson has been finding out more. Football is a sport played by millions of Brits on a regular basis, but the beautiful game couldn't exist without the referee. The demand for referees is something that doesn't seem to ever go away. However, the hunt for someone to watch over the game could deal its biggest blow ever this year, as over 800 amateur football referees from across the country are standing strong against the abuse they receive when officiating games. The referee strike campaign was set up by a teenage referee, Ryan Hampson, in December 2016, and its aim is to gain desperately needed help and funding for amateur referees. Hampson is an aspiring professional, but the lack of respect for him and other referees, including James Ferguson, has caused this strike. I think it is a good thing to do. Uh, I think more needs to be done in terms of protecting referees uh, around the country. So everybody getting together um, as one voice, um, I think obviously that's going to really help to support the campaign. And hopefully something positive uh, will, come, uh, will come out of this. The professional referees that we see in the Premier League on Sky Sports and BT have a number of officials to aid them with their decisions, but grassroots level referees are alone on the pitch. For any one person to try and take control of 22 men or women on their own is some feat, and when they receive abuse, the only protection they have is a yellow and red card. The official laws of the game say that any form of dissent towards the referee, whether foul language is used or not, is an offence worth sending off. However, as the video shows, not all players can accept this fact. Um, I do I do referee local five aside, and you edit there, and it's sometimes your comments, sometimes the other people take it very seriously and get very heated. I don't think we think about the things they say sometimes. Um, we've seen just any get in the game. These people in the heat of the moment. We'll say things and not think about it. A lot of the abuse doesn't just come from the pitch. A number of stories have arose in recent years, speaking out against the abuse refs get from parents. Football coach Nathaniel feels it isn't right. Um, and I, again, I think parents should learn to re lead by example. The, the players aren't going to, the young players aren't going to follow parents' example. Uh, they'll follow their parents' example. So there. Um, you know, shouting from sidelines, abusing referees, and players will say, well, why shouldn't we? So I think they've got to stop and they should be as well teaching the kids. Most referees will have other jobs as a prior source of income. The amount of abuse being received is the main reason young people like Jamie don't want to start officiating games, despite their love of it. It's just not good for the sport, and it makes like people like me who want to become a ref not become a referee, because I don't want to go turn up to let everyone play the game that they love for me to get abuse. I'd love to go to a game and referee a game and just watch it flow. Everyone has a good time and there's no abuse. But with the abuse, I just feel like 
no, I'm not going to step forward to be a referee. Whether the strike in March changes anything in grassroots football remains to be seen. But this football fan is hoping for a change to the beautiful game. And Tom joins us now on the sofa. So, Tom, how widespread is this issue? Um, this issue, uh, it was all over the country. So, 2,000 officials all together, over 2,000 officials came together um, and striked on the, in the first week of, weekend of March. Um, it ranged all, all throughout the country. Um, Manchester is where it started on a Facebook group. Um, and to get any anything involving 2,000 people on Facebook is pretty hard to do, I'd say. I mean, as you're saying, you're packaged there. These referees, all they have is two cards to protect themselves, you know? Yeah. And a whistle. And a whistle, yeah. That's nothing, you yeah. Know? That's... In, these, in the lower leagues, the amateurs, the non-paid um, playing leagues, uh, the referees are on their own. They don't get officials, they don't get any, anyone to help them, anyone to support them. Um, so that's what this is about, trying to get some support, whether it's a bit more funding maybe for officials to be there with them, whatever it is, something needs to be done. Yeah, so what can we expect now that action's been had? Um, well, Ryan Hampson, the, the fellow who set it up, has had a meeting with a representative of the FA, um, so hopefully that's a step in the right direction for, for change, for, like I say, for protection. Well, uh, thank you very much for joining us, Tom. Uh, now from uh, one serious issue, on to another. Yes, indeed. So now some of you may remember what happened on Halloween night last year, where a large group of bikers caused mayhem across Leeds. As a result, a five-year injunction has been granted to Leeds City Council. Yes, uh, banning anyone promoting, organising or participating in antisocial driving involving two or more motor vehicles in any public place. But it seems like not everyone is happy about the decision. Monica Panarowski caught up with members of the Motorcycle Action Group to find out more. On Halloween night last year, a group of off-road motorcycles and quad bikes took to the streets across Lees, which brought Kirksall Road to a standstill for more than 90 minutes. Many witnesses took to social media describing the scenes as utter chaos and compared them to those in the Mel Gibson film Mad Max. Not only that, but the majority of the bikers were seen riding on pedestrian streets and pavements, as well as going against traffic on Kirksall Road whilst pulling wheelies. So far, nine people, including the organiser, have been arrested in connection to the event with police releasing images of further eight people who may have any valuable information. I spoke to members of the Motorcycle Action Group, Leeds, a group of bikers fighting for motorcyclist rights at their annual general meeting to find out their views on the incident. I'm not going to call them bikers because they weren't bikers. Uh, they were basically uh, kids on motorbikes. They just happened to be on motorbikes. Um, and they just caused mayhem throughout the centre of Leeds, which is a, a real shame because it, it's just tainted the whole view of motorcyclists in general. It was totally outrageous and have given generally bikers a very bad name. Most of the bikes were illegal. Uh, these people were not motorcyclists or bikers, whatever you want to use. And although they thought they were having a bit of fun and a laugh, I think it was very alarming for the general public and put everything, every other baker in a bad light, which we've been fighting for years to, to change. As a result, a five-year injunction has been put in place by the Leeds City Council in the hope of preventing such events in the future, but members of MAG are worried that this could be targeting the wrong people. It's too extreme, you know, because they should deal with the problem. It's not going to actually deal with the problem, because most of, the, most of those sort of people, know the police aren't going to catch them. Um, it's just going to penalise people that kind of legitimate motorcyclists going about the normal business. And like one of the things, for example, was we uh, do a Christmas toy run, and it was kind of oh, we're going to have to let everybody know now because they're going to think oh, a group of bikers. It's going to be like you know, so it's kind of tainting all the good work that man have been trying to do over the years. The big problem I've got is that uh, you know, most of these riders that were out on these bikes uh, were on bikes that were obviously um, they're not road registered, so obviously they're not insured either, so they're completely illegal, they shouldn't actually be out there. And what, why the police didn't arrest them when they had knowledge that that ride was going to happen, I really don't know. But the problem is, the ones that it will affect mainly are the ones that are legal, because police had, the police admit that most of the, um, the vehicle uh, crime fighting in Leeds is done by camera. Uh, so if they've got no number plate on, they're not going to catch them. You know, it's only going to be the people that are legal, that are registered, that are going to get done. So, yeah, it's a problem. 
This not only gave a bad name for all bikers, but also damaged years of work between the local authorities and MAG to improve the image of bikers in the area. And with everyone seemingly so far apart on their views towards the incident, it appears this issue will not be resolved anytime soon, putting law-abiding motorcyclists at further risk. Yes, it's uh, certainly a, a serious issue, isn't it? It definitely and, uh, is. For more information, please get in touch with Leeds City Council or the West Yorkshire Police. Yes, well, that is all we have time for in this week's edition. Next week, we will have Lincoln City Manager Danny Cowley for his thoughts on his side's incredible FA Cup run. And what an incredible FA Cup run it was. And it finished in, on Sunday. I don't know if you caught the game. I didn't, no. You didn't? Oh, it was, it was a ter terrific game. Make sure you tune in as you don't want to miss this. Uh, until then, from me and Lauren, goodbye. goodbye.